Van harte welkom allemaal bij de kick-off van de Rotterdam Architectuurmaand 2019. Vierde editie. Uh, we hebben er ontzettend veel zin in en we zijn erg trots op deze plek, uh, mag ik jullie wel vertellen. Dus uh, fijn dat jullie met zoveel mensen zijn gegaan. Uh, ik geloof 1350 mensen al in één week, die wilden graag komen. Dus we zijn uh, blij met de belangstelling en we hopen ook dat die de komende drieënhalve week doorzet. En dat hier wat ons betreft duizenden Rotterdammers uh, binnenkomen, uh, leren over de stad en met elkaar het gesprek voeren daarover. Uh, en dan switch ik graag naar uh, Engels, om het even zo te zeggen. Uh, I'll switch to English. So, uh, so welcome everybody. Uh, on behalf of uh, our team, uh, my name is Bas van der Poel. I work for AIR as director. And together with my colleague Barbara and our team, we've prepared uh, a program for you for the last three and a half weeks, together with many partners. Uh, who I'm going to introduce to you all. Um, I'm going to do my best. I have five minutes, so I'll, uh, I'll give my best. I, and I hope everybody is comfortable. I'm looking around. Are the, is the seating okay? <laughs> it was specially designed. It was a creative process that lasted one weekend, and we had only two weeks to finish up, and I'll tell you about it. Uh, in a few minutes. Uh, so welcome to our guests, uh, Iran Ken from New York, uh, ODA architects uh, working on this building, Transformation of Post, uh, invited here to share his experiences as a New York-based architect traveling back and forth to Rotterdam. We hope to learn from your personal stories and your view on the craft of architecture as well. And welcome to Kees Kaan, uh, well-respected Rotterdam-based architect, uh, thanks for coming. Uh, we will invite you both to uh, join each other in conversation about architecture, about this city, about this development and your collaboration. Uh, so thank you for coming. And we've asked uh, Kees to, to finish up with uh, what we now call an opening statement for the Rotterdam Architecture Month. Uh, because we're going to close it as well uh, in the final weekend, which is the yearly architecture day uh, produced by uh, OMI, uh, among other things they do this month. Uh, and we're going to finish by a sharp debate, by popular demand. So we'll do that. Um, just in short, to give you a feel for the Rotterdam Architecture Month, what we're going to do. Um, what we're going to do here, it's what we've called the post podium. And who to thank? Uh, I shouldn't forget that. So, uh, first about the Architecture Month. We started four years ago uh, in a collaboration with Rotterdam Festivals and uh, Rotterdam Partners in kind of a basic way. We thought, well, there's great initiatives, there's great festivals. Uh, we've got the Architecture Day, which is the most successful in, in the Netherlands. We're quite proud of that. We've got the rooftop days and people crowding on top of roofs, uh, crowding into buildings, learning from the stories behind them through many programs. We already have that in Rotterdam. It's not something that we have to create. So we said, well, let's do a light coordination of that, right? To coordinate the calendar. So make sure that people perhaps can collaborate. So that's why we started out, uh, to communicate. Uh, a shared calendar, so people can perhaps learn from each other and new people can join in. Uh, and in the end, our ambition was to invite new uh, people in, new partners, to co-program the Architecture Month with us. Uh, so this was the first phase, we did it for three years, uh, but we felt it was necessary for us and for everybody involved to, to move to a next phase. Uh, you could say Rotterdam, and I think it's still in the city's vision, uh, that architecture and cultural heritage is a power for the transformation of the city. And if that's what we state, uh, and if that's what we convince it could be, uh, we then should do more than just celebrate architecture or celebrate the built environment. We should learn together, we should explore new avenues, we should get inspired, we should debate on the future of the city, and we felt that the Architecture Month needed a more solid podium to do that. To invite people in, to meet each other, to converse and to learn, and also to showcase new ideas. So this is why we searched out uh, a place 
what would be fitting uh, this, this ambition we, we share with Rotterdam festivals and uh, Rotterdam partners. Um, and, we, and we felt we should, we should search for a spot which is in between the public and the private, because that's where architecture is made uh, nowadays. It should be, should be a space to invite in, to open up, um, and also to search for relationships between those two, the public and the private. So we're very happy and actually thankful as well uh, for Omdam Group, uh, who's now owner of this building, this beautiful, majestic Rotterdam piece of cultural heritage, uh, to open up, uh, to say welcome, uh, to have the ambition and share the ambition to open up this building again for the city in a few years, and to have us and all our partners test this ambition and invite the people of Rotterdam to come in. So, uh, Idan, thank you for opening the door, for giving us the key for four weeks. Uh, we agreed on which terms. Uh, we'll be, we'll be make sure, making sure that we don't cut out any tiles. Uh, we don't drill in the, in the, in the floor. Uh, we don't have people getting lost in the building and falling down steps. Uh, we'll make sure it's safe and it's fun. Uh, and this is what we're gonna do. Uh, so thank you. Um, I think uh, what the most important thing I should mention opening the architecture month as I'm doing now is to say that it's, it's a massive collaboration. So it's people initiating big festivals. I already mentioned the yearly day of architecture. Uh, OMI is, uh, is organizing and it's, uh, it's at the end of the program, actually it is the 15th and the 16th of, uh, of June. Uh, opening up four areas in Rotterdam, for four urban areas, opening up all the buildings, good, good guides, learning about the stories behind the bu building. So it's a very interesting program as well this year. Uh, and, and mainly I think the, my curiosity would be with Buddy Rijnhaven, which is new in the program this year. So uh, collaborating with Peter and his team to, to have a debate on how these areas in Rotterdam are, that are on the old city axis how they add up and make a better city. So uh, the inner city, uh, called single developments, right through uh, Hart van Zuid, uh, across Rijnhaven with Fernet City on the edge a bit. Uh, how does this add up to a better city? So we're going to explore that uh, through the program. Uh, we have rooftop days, which is next week already, uh, which is up to 20,000 people, and we counted it as one event. So we have 50 events, and the rooftop days are one event. But if you push the button and it opens up, it's 50 events in itself. So it's a great uh, effort by, by Leon van Geest and all his team to, to organize this uh, and also address the opportunities that are on the second layer of the city and how to develop it into a sustainable and even accessible uh, part of Rotterdam. So uh, it's a very interesting part of the program. So you might say these programs are using the city as a, po as a podium and as many others. It's, it's the, the, the restart of talks about architecture, a celebrated series. Uh, of international architects talking about design, about materials, about the cultural part, uh, the artistic quality of design, and many others. Uh, Parfum de Boom Boom will take us everywhere on the ground. Uh, urban guides will share stories and you can tag along, explore the interbellum on the Col Single and everywhere. So it's, it's, a, it's a big program. Uh, you should really visit the site. Uh, and within this podium, we said, well, we'll focus on the layered city. Uh, if Rotterdam states that we want to densify, we want to build the future city within the existing city, then we run into all kinds of opportunities and also issues. So it's the layering of perspectives, the layering of needs of people, the layering of qualities, and we have to find out how to do that, uh, to, to be proud of what's there and to build on that. So we're going to talk about the, our cultural heritage, uh, what I already mentioned, the urban area development that, yeah, that you can see here, uh, we're, going to, we're going to explore um, the vertical side of our city and how uh, high-rises are innovated. And of course, uh, we're going to explore how well, the everyday living environment uh, is improving, is in gaining quality, uh, and how architects play, take up their role in that. So, uh, um, so okay, up to the thinking part. Um, uh, we have to start with all the partners. I didn't mention all the names, but it's from the Arthur Fair Film Festival to OMI, uh, Urban Guides, it's uh, the Rotterdam Late Night Talk Show, 
it's 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 35 parties. So um, I think it's a great story of Rotterdam to, to, for all them to come together in this period. Uh, it's our co-initiators, Rotterdam Festivals and Rotterdam Partners, of course. It's Omi and Peter's team. We, we have been working with, with them tirelessly the past few weeks to get this done here. Uh, Peter being the artistic leader and remembering us that, yes, we asked designers to do something here, so give them the space, even though we have one week left. Uh, so thank you, Peter, for reminding us. Um, I have to thank Studio 1 op 1, who designed the installation that you are all a part of now. Uh, just to give you a feel, um, the density of the crutches is related to the areas depicted behind you. And then the height of the, 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 the crutches symbolizes the differences in income levels in these different areas of the cities. So if you sit low, be aware, um, and I think it's an important story, um, they symbolize people living below the poverty standard. So we can talk about architecture, we should be aware. And I think it's, it's a great find by Studio Enopain to address this and to ask questions to our program as well. So uh, I have to thank the team uh, of uh, people working here. Uh, carpenters, electricians, uh, and our uh, Yolanda uh, from Dinter uh, powering all people to finish on time uh, this afternoon, actually. So, so thank you, team, everybody. And uh, the city of Rotterdam. Uh, it was quite interesting to see many of the urban designers actually transforming into model builders uh, to create all these models here. And so thank you, Arjen uh, Knooster and your team to, uh, for the effort. Uh, and we invite you in to collaborate and to be a part of the debates as well, but I'm sure you are, as you have been always, so. Okay. Um, to sum up the, uh, the introduction, uh, and, and now moving on. Uh, Eran, uh, you've traveled uh, all the way from uh, New York, and then you went to London, and then you went to Paris, and then you went to Amsterdam, and you are just in time today here, and you're gonna stay with us for a few days. Two days, oh, and then you're going to fly back. So, uh, as you said, we have this this well rather small Dutch, uh, you know, post for you to lean into <laughs> after all this traveling. And our question to you is: In 30 minutes, um, tell your personal story, share with us your perspective on the craft, and help us understand this transformation. So, uh, without further ado, I would like to invite you around to. Take us along into your story. Um, ladies and gentlemen, Eran Ken. Thank you. I was saying that this is a, 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 a very Dutch stool because it's thin and tall. In America, it's going to be big and low. Well, it's a pleasure to be here today and uh, speak to you, Rotterdammers, as a New Yorker. I couldn't uh, think of a better place to start the Architectural Month than right here in this great hall, in this great building. You know, I spent about two years of my time being here, walking, sketching, dreaming this place, so clearly I think this is the right choice. Before I start, I want to thank uh, the Umnam Group for allowing us uh, to be here and to use it, but more importantly, for being such a great partner. Um, in sort of propelling this project forward. Special thanks for David Zisser, who owns Onam Group, for his leadership and its passion and its vision. I don't think he's here today. Uh, but there were so many junctions along the way that uh, the Onam Group could take a different path and they chose to do the right thing. So I really appreciate that. Thank you. Um, and I am full of confidence that you guys, David, Idan Sada, who runs the show here, and the entire Omnam group is going to deliver and execute without compromise one of the most ambitious projects in the city. So thank you for that. I also want to thank uh, the city of Rotterdam for all of you to being so welcome, to ODA and myself, to the committees um, that we spend really amazing time together kind of visualizing the future here, Anne Michel and the beauty committee, and uh, Ariane with city planning, and all of the preservation committees. And I also want to thank our partners, uh, Braxmeyer Ross, who is here, and Ebite that uh, helped us 
to vision this. Now, there's great chemistry between our cities, New York and, and Rotterdam. Uh, both cities share this kind of unbelievable resiliency and this ambition that never dies to live, to grow, to sustain itself, which makes it so dynamic and also so attractive to people. Not too far from here, Hotel New York is where immigrants from all over Europe used to sail to, from the gate of Europe to the gate of America. And Dutch communities came to New York and built the Lower East Side, downtown Manhattan, Brooklyn, Bronx, even Harlem. I don't know if many people know that. I am sort of an immigrant to New York myself. I grew up in a small town. It was sort of a working family's town and our house complex, our building complex, was basically composed of three sides of row houses, creating a U-shape around a courtyard. And all my memories as a child was from this courtyard. I remember that I used to come from home and play, and my mom would come home at around five o'clock, and she would make dinner, and she would go to the balcony, and she would call me. But instead of calling my name, she used to whistle. <whistles> we had a whistle. And, but we're not the only one. My, all of my friends and their family had their own whistles, and around five o'clock, <laughs> the courtyard would be filled with symphony of whistles, and we would know the day's over and it's time to go home. It's like an ancient ringtone, you know? So it's quite different um, than my, my children's experience in New York. You know, um, I live on the Upper West Side in New York. Wife, three kids, and a dog, boo. And um, about a month ago, I took my youngest son to a play date. You know what a play date is? When the parents are arranging for the kids to play. Otherwise, they don't meet. So as we're walking down the street, we're on 70th Street, my kid says, hey, Daddy, where did you used to play when you were my age? And intuitively, I just said, I played in the street. And he literally stopped, he looked at me and he said, Daddy, were you homeless? <laughs> so there's quite a difference of perception here. Um, my childhood narrative and he, uh, the way that it's unfolded really uh, imprinted on my consciousness. And I think my trajectory as an architect. And so, um, I came to New York about 20 years ago. And in my head, I had all these stories that I read of Jane Jacobs talking about communities of the village in Harlem and the big struggle forces between the life of the community and Robert Moses who kind of paved all of these highways. And I pictured in my head things that we all recognize here, right? Depicting the life in the building as it unfolds to the street almost naturally through the windows, through the stoop, through the retail. So the life in the street used to be kind of vibrant, diverse, but yet it was communal and very personal and private. Well, 20 years ago when I came, a lot of it was gone already, and now, as you know, as the city continues to densify, we lost a lot of those qualities. But I still believe, deep in my heart, that the quality of life in city is directly dependent on the relationship between our intimate life within the buildings and our communal spaces that relates to them. And once this relationship starts to vanish, New York City, we might end up building a series of cities that are nothing but accumulation of individuals living in you know, solitary cubes. And so I think that we need to always think that as we develop density in cities, and by the way, density is extremely important, as we develop density, we continue and develop the public realm. And we continue and find new innovative ways, not just at the street level, but at the building level. I opened my office ODA 12 years ago, and it was a bit of an, sort of an American story. I started a very small studio apartment on the Upper West Side. And we always seek for ideas by which we can address elements of community scale and context. We used to do, uh, many years ago, these diagrams that shows the expansion of the building. We called it the breathing room of a building. To what degree a building could shrink and extract within the zoning regulations to expand the architectural qualities and the life within buildings. This led to um, many, many buildings that we've built. To date, we've uh, built about 50 buildings only in, in New York. 
uh, but all of them really seek to address elements of sort of untackling the elements of change of cities as it becomes much more densified. So we call it Unboxing the City, and what I'd like to do today, very quickly, is share with you five lessons we learned in this process. So we like to say that a tower is a neighborhood, and as you know, we design today and build buildings that have so many people in them that they can constitute a neighborhood. And what I mean by that, think about a tower with 2,000 people, for example. That's pretty common in big cities. This amount of people that shares a territory, in this case a vertical one, justifies urban amenities that relates to it. It justifies a local school, a kindergarten, a coffee shop, right? A dog run, a little playground. So if we're thinking of a typical neighborhood, low-rise neighborhood, maybe there's many like this in, in, in Rotterdam, that has all of these amenities, they provide for some sort of a, a democratic way of circulating, right? We, we can choose our way home. Now think about the same amount of people going into a vertical tower. The circulation in a vertical tower is dictated, oops, sorry, is dictated by the elevator and it's always a dead-end circulation. And in addition, all of the urban amenities that we had are not part of that story most of the time. So when we've been asked to design a big, big tower in San Francisco, what you see here is Market Street. You know Market Street. It goes all the way through San Francisco to the water. And Venice Street that crosses it. At the foreground on two sides, there are low-rise neighborhoods. And in the middle, there's area that the city wants to gentrify. It's basically garages and industrials. And they asked us to build uh, 1,200 apartments in one building. Now, we had this crazy dilemma. Next door to us, 2,000 people, which is 1,200 apartment more or less, live in this neighborhood, and we're going to do it here. This is pretty sad. Can we flip the idea of the neighborhood 90 degrees and actually build a vertical building that includes all of these amenities in it? And so what we've done is used the urban amenities to connect two separate elevator cores and avoid dead end. So there's always a circulation and a matter of choice. Essentially, it was a big deal for the city uh, because it really signifies a new area that is, is coming up. And we talked about the fact that it looks like Twin Peaks over the Golden Gate Bridge. But what's important really is that the building creates templates for all of these uh, activities to, to survive, and perhaps for a more um, democratic communal way to live within the building itself. Now, you've probably seen those slender towers in New York City. This is crazy. These are a building that has one apartment per floor, and they go vertically. And in these cases, there's no much where to go but up. But in New York City, you can go as high as you'd like. So we thought, what would we do if we can stretch the building beyond its program, creating literally gaps in the building? And in those gaps, we're going to have communal and private gardens that are very similar to backyard and front yard, but they're up yard and down yard. And so I love this because on the left side, you have Chrysler building, this beautiful sort of art deco expression of, of corporate power. And then you've got the, uh, uh, the, the UN building, which is very monolith. And then perhaps there's going to be a new expression of vertical housing. In LA, we're designing the, the tallest residential tower in downtown LA. And um, it's kind of funny for a city that it's all about flat and cars. But the city recognized that people are urging for downtown living without cars to be accessible to things. And what we've done is we've basically created a communal house that was designed separately than the tower and elevated up to the middle of the building so everybody in the building can share these amenities equally, the views to the city, and also it becomes this iconic element that connects everyone. And very similarly, this is downtown Seattle. Now, I don't know if you know, Seattle is a city that prides itself uh, uh, by being connected to nature. But more and more people want to live downtown. And so we said, can we create a communal garden at the middle of the building? It's about 1,500 square meters large. It's about 20 meters tall. And what's unique about this is it frames all of these beautiful natural elements around the city, Mount Rainier, Mount St. Helen, the Fugit Sound. And essentially, it's the only garden in the city that has those views. 
And you recognize downtown Manhattan as a lot of residential developments are coming in. I'm going to skip that and move on. Public realm is more than a street. Hmm. So let's think of uh, an extreme case of a tower, right? A tower condenses a lot of people in a very small footprint. That's basically the definition of a tower. Now, by the time you have a core, and then you have a lobby, and then you have a back of the house, and then you have parking, there's really not much space else left in the bottom of the tower. So now let's envision a street that has many towers. Okay? What do you get? You get streets that have huge amount of traffic, people walking back and forth all the time, but very little space for community engagement. So we started searching what can be done, and in, in our office, we're in a search consistently of the gaps, the voids, the little you know, parking lot that is unutilized. Every little space that is underutilized at the street, we want to use, we want to design, we want to nurture, which kind of links to what the solution that we've done here, which we'll talk about a little later. If you know Midtown Manhattan, as a tourist, it's really great. You come in, all of these people in the street, ah, New York. But the reality is that it's a sea of people walking. You can't even stop, otherwise you're going to be smashed. And there's very little place for communities to form and survive. And, and that reality is pretty gloomy. And I think the city is in a state of crisis because of that. So I think what we need to think about, and a city like Rotterdam, I bless the opportunity to discuss that, has a chance to expand the streets and not just rely on that public space before it's too late, because it's much harder to fix it later. So in our search um, at ODA, we, we search for spaces like this and we discover something amazing. 30% of the open space in Manhattan is where? Inside courtyards of the city block. So New York City has these city blocks that are long, but inside every block there's this. You don't even know that if you walk in the street. What this is, is a series of privately owned little courts. Most of the time they're used for mechanical system storages and garbage. In Europe, this would be a communal or public space. In New York, this is private, and it's 30% of the open space of the city. We thought, what if we could use that space as an extension of the public realm? And so when we got the, the opportunity, we designed a building in Bushwick. Bushwick is a, is a neighborhood in Brooklyn. It's one of those gentrified neighborhoods that has a lot of layers of uh, historical uh, uh, communities and it's becoming the place for the newcomers, the tattoos, the beards, the bars, the artists. And how do you bring into such a fragmented scale such a big building? This is 1,200 apartments, 1 1.2 million square foot of mixed use, and we thought of the idea of the courtyards. What if we can take the New York City block and we overlap this with the idea of the little streets and the little courtyards that occurs in Europe, create the democracy of movement, so what we've done is we've basically demapped the center street as a public park. It's open to the entire community. And then created five interconnecting courtyards that are open to the entire community at large. This is half of the building after it was built. Now the other half is built. The roof is a green roof and it's 6,000 square meters of communal park. Now, these courtyards that I was talking about, is hi they're highly uh, curated, not just architecturally to bring light, but also programmatically so people can actually enjoy them. And what I love about this is that the private life that we have in this building connects directly into the communal life that it's part of, which is kind of what I said in the beginning. About two years ago, I created a non-for-profit organization called OPEN. OPEN stands for ODA, which is my firm, Public Engagement in Neighborhoods. And the idea was that we're going to collect money through friends and family and whatever, and we're going to reach out to artists within the communities by which we work, and reach out to them to create art within our projects. The result of it 
was a series of 15 mega murals done by hand by these local artists telling their own story imprinted in the building itself. And that really became one of the biggest art collection in New York City for public art. We placed them in single loaded corridors, you can see here, to improve the connection or the visual connection. And you can start seeing how that plays out. So a residential building is much more than just a place for people to live. It's a place of engagement. This is supposed to have volume, but if it doesn't sound, no? The actors, by the way, are ODA employees. <laughs> but we keep up with the people who move there, and one of the fascinating things about this is 20% of the apartments is affordable housing. So it's about 250 units within this building that are regulated by the affordable housing program of the city, and they're dispersed equally, both horizontally and vertically, everywhere in the building. And it's quite amazing how well it works. And I want to say that I think the program of incorporating affordable housing within as a percentage of projects around the city is a brilliant idea to create cities much more uh, equal and accessible to all. Another example, oh, before I go another example, these are the old formulas that we know for social housing. New York City has a lot of them. And that's... That's a formula of disaster. This is, this is, we all know what this brings. We just completed three towers in Williamsburg. Williamsburg is right on the East River, right by the Williamsburg Bridge right here. And those three towers have 750 apartments, 20% out of them affordable housing. It's spread both horizontally and vertically. And so you can basically rent this amazing apartment, everybody's dream, views to Manhattan right on the water for let's say $3,500 and next door you can have exactly the same apartment for 600 bucks. Everybody shares the amenities and clearly it's a big, it's a big city uh, overlooking, uh, look at the pool, overlooking the Willisburg Bridge, quite amazing. And we designed this tower in a way that every apartment is a corner unit. So think about this. From a studio to a bedroom to a three bedroom, it's all corner units, which gives this building its shape and its dynamic form, and also create outdoor spaces that collects water. And we like to say that this building is about quality and it's about equality. So we're kind of proud of that. Mixed use is a new outlook. Um, I just want to say we all know by now that there's a lot of people who want to live in a mixed use neighborhood. People like that next to their residential buildings, there's also kind of a little office, a little this, a little, and that's great. It's more walkable, it's more sustainable, it's the right thing to do, it's 24 seven. But I think that when we start combining different uses into one building, it becomes really interesting. Because we as architects and planners, and, and et cetera, we are forced to create these uh, different uses to adapt to one another in a way that they're not used to adapt. And maybe that's a better expression of the way we want to live our life when they are changing based on the form of mixed use. For example, this project in Atlanta, uh, we designed it to include two residential towers, an office building, retail, performance center, and a museum, all as one big complex. So when we started doing it, we realized that which one of those programs has to change. They couldn't stay the same way. The museum, on the left, from a freestanding building, became basically a landscape and hardscape, right here on the left, that serves the entire uh, community of the building. The performance center is this cantilever that creates the gateway to the entire thing. The retail is this tiered area that is looking into that courtyard, and the residential amenities are within the building itself. It's sort of a whole new neighborhood. And, all of it is surrounding a civic space. 
privately owned civic place. It's owned by the, 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 the owner, but it's given back into the city, so it becomes a new kind of form of gathering. And I want to finish with adaptive reuse, uh, which I think is the new contextual. Uh, we can talk for hours about why is important, adaptive reuse is important for the future of our cities, but mainly you have to think about that our culture changes much faster than our building ages. Buildings can stay for 100 years, and we're changing so rapidly within this time. Adaptive reuse is really the future. But as architects, we always talk about what's contextual. And we talk about physical things, materials, penetration, scale. These are the things that make a building contextual. So why are we building so many generic buildings that look like anything else everywhere in the world? Because our world becomes so global that contextuality to little architectural things is not enough. What I think is important is that the narrative of people in a certain place and time and the ability of architecture to tell a story is going to be much more contextual because that story only belongs in a certain place. It cannot go anywhere else. Two examples. The first one is a building in Brooklyn, in Dumbo, also on the water. It used to be a factory. Best location, probably the ugliest building you've seen. And it's landmark, in a landmark neighborhood. I'm Michelle. We recognize the story of the building is quite interesting. Three facades are original. But the facade in the middle that you see is a later infill. It was actually done when half of the building was demolished in the 20s. So we said, why can we replace this facade with something else? This used to be, I'm sorry, a sugar refinery factory. So a can of sugar would come in from Brazil. They make a grain of sugar, go up to Chicago. And then um, we proposed a faceted facade that is inspired by the idea of sugar crystal that tells sort of the story of the history of that building, and that was co composed with three facades of historical uh, context, and the building is now kind of telling the whole story, uh, not the whole, but part of the story of Dumbo. It was recently uh, leased to a company from New York for the highest dollar amount per square foot ever in Brooklyn. So there's attraction of people to be associated with buildings that has a story. This is the other facade that, that uh, provides the entrance from the historical context, and here you see it at night, and here you see it in a movement. We like to say that the dynamic movement of the facade reflects the dynamic nature of this neighborhood. Which brings me to, last but not least, this amazing building right here. And there's no better explicit story about adaptive reuse than just this place, the old post office building. This is, this is a story not just about a building, and not just about a neighborhood, but it's a story of a whole city. It's a city that in the 1930s was extremely strong in trade and had this amazing ambition to lead Europe in trade. And they said, oh, let's build this amazing avenue, avenue of the people, we'll call it Kulsingel. And then let's build three amazing buildings on it that represents our culture. Let's build our civic structure, this is the city hall. Let's build the post office building, that's connection to the world. And let's build our World Trade Center to represent how rich we are. And it's also a story of how this dream have collapsed to the ground in World War II, where the whole city was bombed, and miraculously, these three structures remained. Smart Germans. It's also a story about a civic place, this hall, that used to act like a beehive of people. Hundreds of people came in and out, workers, people going selling a telegraph or getting a mail and an urban story about how Kulsikel can become the avenue of the people again, with Aryan and many other that are gonna transform this into a green avenue, and with buildings that would bring people together and connect between different neighborhoods that maybe now are disconnected. The monolithic nature of this building would remain 
but it's programmed inside this courtyard, surrounding by retail on all sides, restaurants, bars, that are gonna be affordable, so everybody can use them. Connecting into the back, back courtyard that would be, again, coffee shop, inviting, that would resonate to the outside streets, and we create activity 24-7 with different programs supporting the public realm, housing, hotel, retail, conference center. And at the end, it's a story about these two magical halls. This one, the historical one, and the one that we're saving at the back that used to be the delivery, the, the uh, loading and unloading of the trucks that now will transform again into a public space, connect the two together and connect all the way from Kulsilgel to Rodezand, bring these two civic rooms back to the people of Rotterdam as a place of celebration, as a place of community, as a place of scale. And you can see how the new tower with this mega structure would land in a way that allows lights to come from its side and wash the surrounding walls around it and it's you face in Rotterdam, facing into Timmer House and the Museum of Rotterdam that is a bit forgotten. And at the end, it's a story about fragile tower that takes its inspiration from this building, but as opposed to, the, to being so heavy and monolithic, it's light and fragile and open, and it expresses life in city it creates sustainable elements like confusing the wind and collecting water. And I believe that the building tells an honest and authentic story that forever would be contextual to Rotterdam. I don't think this building would ever be built anywhere else uh, in the world. Rodezand and the new entrance. Stadhoistraat with the entrance to the hotel right across from the Rose Garden at City Hall. The main entrance where you came from. You'd come to sort of a subdued and dark space and then open up to this amazing hall. The skylights above this thing will replace with a new glass that would shed bright light into the heart of this place. Small-scale retail, not big box, affordable, inviting. And then a connection through right here into the back courtyard. And then from there on, outside to Rodezan. I hope that the design of the building, the way the base relates to its historical counterpart and the post office kind of horizontally connect to everything, really tells a story about a tower that was born from an historical building. And it would color the sort of the skylight of, of uh, Rotterdam with a beautiful shimmering light and transparency and provide outdoor spaces. And I just want to finish with something I wrote that it was said and sometimes it was said about Rotterdam with a trace of criticism that the eclectic style of its building reflects its lack of particular char character. Well, in our modern society, style is not a measure of culture. What signifies vibrant culture is change. And a constant developing of narrative a transparent story of people, place, and time, and a constant balance between density, sustainability, and the public realm. No wonder, therefore, that Rotterdam is one of the most exciting cities in the world today, and I am so proud that I can make a small part in your story. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
to see you. Case, please join us. <laughs> so, Iran, you end up in the middle after all, right? You end up in the middle after all. <laughs> so, everybody's still comfortable. We, we planned on doing a lecture of 45 extra minutes, but we'll cut it short and uh, talk Comfort for Comfort is not the biggest virtue of these chairs. What is, in your opinion? <laughs> About the chairs? Well, I love the idea of expressing the social, economical state of the people of Rotterdam through this installation. And I like the fact that it makes people a bit uncomfortable. What about you, guys? Well, I, I, mu I must say I was very surprised by the comfort act, really. When I <laughs> sat down, I felt like, oh, it's isolated. You know, it's not that cold. And uh, they're also fixed to the floor, so sort of you don't hear the constant squeaking and cracking of chairs moving uh, when everybody feels a little bit chilly and starts moving around. It's very quiet. So in that sense, it gives a lot of comfort as well. I also want to say, that Dutch people are tough people. <laughs> you should I mean, elaborate now. You pull this thing in New York City, after five minutes, everybody leaves. <laughs> <laughs> you guys are resilient. This is... So about tough people. <laughs> uh, it was interesting to, uh, when, when he invited you, uh, we posed the question, uh, who do you want to meet? And then uh, we got back through all these people in between. Uh, that in the end, you wanted to meet Case. And, uh, and Francine Huben as well, I think, right? right. But she couldn't come, so she's traveling. Uh, but you wanted to meet Case. And, uh, and I, w I, I dug into that a bit. Uh, I explored a bit with Aidan and with, uh, uh, with the people from the municipality in Iron. And, uh, and in the beginning, you weren't that a good friend, right? So. It <laughs> <laughs> And now you sit here. Uh, so, so, so could you please, Case, okay, just elaborate a bit. You, you're not only an architect and a teacher, a professor, you're also um, a supervisor, right, for the inner city of Rotterdam. And yeah, it's, yeah. it's a critical advisor, a think along, yeah, uh, a struggle I'm, along, right? Sometimes I'm allowed to take part of discussions on projects, and uh, then I'm trying to sort of imagine the, everybody's position and everybody's idea and trying to have empathy, but I'm also thinking from the interest of the city, of course. And this time um, I, was, I received a phone call um, from the city and they said, Peter Spakman, process manager, he said, yeah, maybe it's good if you already take some time in your agenda for this project because it's going to take a few sessions. It's not going to be one talk. <laughs> it's going to be more. And I said, OK, uh, what is it? Well, it's uh, that project. And then I said, OK, <clears throat> let's go there. And I have to admit that when I heard about this project, I thought, oh my god, this is going to be difficult. Because like you said, Aaron, the call signal, there were three building standing after the bomb, bombing two, um, well actually I think all three of them are monuments uh, and uh, well in a couple of years from now two of them will bear towers on their head, um, which, is, position. which says something about <laughs> the city I think. And um, so when I was invited to come and, uh, and have a look at the project, I thought, okay, why does this tower have to be here? You know, there's so much space in the city. Why exactly does it have to be here on top of this uh, building? That is, of course, that was my first uh, feeling. And um, then I arrived in the meeting and uh, we got everything explained and we got the project explained. And that's when I understood that the, the fact that a tower 
was possible on this building was already in the uh, B plan of the city, so in its bestemmingsplan. So it was already a given uh, fact. The building was marked with a spot that said you can put a tower on this building. So that was a sort of starting point for the, for the discussion, for the talk with Oman and with uh, Aaron on the, on the project. You want me to continue? Yeah, take <laughs> us along. Yeah. Uh, it's an interesting so insight, right? <laughs> so then you can, so you, you can then start, you can then bring up um, whether or not it should have bear tower or... Um, but um, when, the, when, when the fact is there, when it's, uh, the owner of the building has bought the project with the possibility to build a tower, and this is already a given fact, then it's better to enter the discussion uh, with the idea how to do that then in such a way that it sort of generates a synergy, that something really good comes out of it. So that's what I did, that's what I decided. So I decided to put my first sort of uh, question aside for a, for a moment and, and see whether this was possible, whether it would be possible to enter in a dialogue and to see to get uh, what would be feasible in this uh, project. So that's sort of the the introduction to the story, you could say. Well, I'm interested because we visited your firm, and which is on the water as well, and we looked out the window and you said, well, Rotterdam is a layered city, right? So you, we were browsing these buildings, and one after the other that appeared on the waterfront. You said, well, Rotterdam's a layered city. And then you said, well, it's a vital city. We don't have to be afraid of it. We just have to have to accept that a space to experiment, but you ha just we have to go for it and push back and, and go for the debate as, as professionals. So is that perhaps part of your story underneath that you said, well, let's go for it, but I'm going to push back? Yeah, it definitely is. I mean, since I started working in Rotterdam, before I started in Rotterdam, I had like something like 10, 15 years in Amsterdam, which is a completely different city, as you all know. <laughs> and um, we started at the Boompjes. The building is gone now, so the building in which we had our office is demolished. That also happens in Rotterdam. Um, but I was looking at the river uh, every day, and um, I saw the Red Bridge was there, the Erasmus Bridge was almost finished, the Hoge Heer were built, you know, I saw it building by building on the river side and on the land side, the water side and the land side, you could say, changing uh, the city around, around us because I was in this glass box looking at it every day. And very often I thought, whoa, this is a big change, you know, oh, another tower up at Wijnhaven Island and another one, and then I thought, this is quite uh, something, but it taught me that every time something uh, came, within a week you already forgot what was there before. <laughs> that happens when a building gets demolished very often. It's almost that you cannot imagine it anymore. But you also get used very quickly to the, to the new projects. And of course there have been accidents in Rotterdam in the last years in terms of say, projects that maybe could have been slightly better. <laughs> but I think there's also been a lot of very nice projects, very good projects, and in general the city is becoming more and more uh, vital, dynamic and interesting to live in. It's a very nice city to be, Rotterdam. And I, I know that 20 years ago it was really much more boring and uh, much less interesting. So I have learned from all that, I have learned to put my prejudice a little bit aside and to look at things in a bit more open way. And um, when the cruise boat enters the, uh, and enters the river or the, it docks at the Wilhelmina Pier or another big vessel passes by, I also sometimes think, Han Michel, did you approve that this vessel uh, is <laughs> docking here? And all, are the balconies on the on the cruises all designed properly? I don't know that, because it's there. Yeah, I know on a weekly basis, uh, uh, every 
every Thursday the whole day the Aida is lying there on the Wilhelmina Pier or the Rotterdam or you know maybe we should also um, scrutinize those ships of course <laughs> architecturally I mean so this is not to make fun of it but it's something since um, since I'm part of this uh, community Rotterdam and since I'm I was in the welstand and the hoogbouw and all these committees that talk about uh, projects in the city I learned a lot um, but I also have learned that this dialogue is super important because my um, objective has always been not to be uh, I cannot translate it sickener mm. <laughs> cranky but I to think. try to see what we what can be this, a project is an opportunity how can we make it uh, work you know how can it be as good as possible for uh, Rotterdam okay so so if, if you then in the end end up at this point that you say well there's happy accidents and there's well slightly less happy accidents and in the end every project's an opportunity right but it, then you put the, you, you say well the debate is essential and and the, between of you, the two of you of course well, we take it that it has been happening. Uh, but what kind of questions would it pose to the craft and to, to us as a community as well so to, to, to make sure that every happy accident makes a better city? What, what, is, what is then asked of us? I'm, I'm curious. Now, these are very specific always. Eh? The I mean, there is always the general uh, uh, position, you could say, that okay when when uh, a project is done in the city when a pro when a developer or uh, any initiative uh, uh, party uh, does a project in the city what does it what does it give back because it takes uh, a position in the city it takes space it sort of um, yeah um, occupies uh, a part of the city part of the city's territory so what how does it contribute to the to the well of the city uh, in general by the program of course but also uh, the way it connects the way it's the climate the sun the wind all these aspects have to be have to be uh, looked at so if I, and if I listen to your presentation uh, around, then it becomes increasingly important when a d city densifies, right? Yeah. So, so why did you make a point of this <coughs> uh, layering of functions, let's say a mixed use uh, of programs, but also of affordability? Uh, why did you make a point of it to state that explicitly? Because it's, it's, it's a debate we have in the city, of course. It's, it's developing, you use the word gentrifying, it's, 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 it's becoming a dirty word maybe even in Rotterdam. So why, do, why did you make a point of it to, to, to touch upon that? Well, first, if I may, I, I want to sort of relate to what you said about the cruise ship crossing in front of you. Because it just reminded me that this, this artist, Baxi, I don't know if you've heard of this artist, Baxi, now in the, uh, the Biennale for Art in Venice, he designed, he basically drew a series of paintings that makes a huge wall that combines together into a cruise ship. And he basically presents this idea of these cruise ships are taking over uh, Venice. And you know, the cops would push him back and forth from the street, nobody liked that idea. But if you've been in Venice lately, you, you, you're like in this city frozen in time, and all of a sudden you've got this mega cruise ship crosses. Um, so I think it's a very interesting point about the cruise ships because what we don't want, I feel, is that our cities are gonna die because it's not dynamic and it's not developing, it's not going anywhere. Uh, and that's what happens to Venice. It becomes a playground for adults who are coming in to visit. And there's other cities that I can think about that um, are heading that direction. There's more tourists than people that are actually living in the, build, in, in the city itself. So my point of view, and maybe that's sort of being a New Yorker, cities has to develop or die. Uh, it's not so much a matter of choice anymore. Now, there's clearly risk in development because you're not sure what you're gonna get. But I have to say that the process that I've seen here 
the scrutiny that I've seen here in this process, I've not seen anywhere else in the world. In New York City, just as in, or generally speaking in America, you come up with a plan, let's say that it's a protected area, you go to one presentation, you present it, you get comments, you come back, here I address the comments, thank you very much, shake hand, good luck in your project, three years later it's built. Here I came in and it's like, The first time that Han Michel saw my presentation, he's like, who is this guy? <laughs> I expected to come in, do a presentation, thank you very much, shake hands, bye-bye. So what I've learned, though, is that the Dutch way of making, taking decision, and the scrutiny that it goes through, which might be difficult, might be long, allows so many smart people to have an opinion. And I think the, this allows you to make better choices. That doesn't mean that all of the choices are going to be great, as, as Kay is saying, but uh, it allows you to make better choices. And I think that that's something you should be very proud of and never lose, because there's always going to be a power of development and money to grow faster, to get more approvals. Let's just go. Let, and, and the idea of cities that infiltrate through this, uh, through scrutinies, is very good. Now, the, the, the point that I wanted to make was um, that in the process of um, densifying, we sometimes tend to forget the bad impact of these vertical buildings. And the bad impact is not, in my mind, shadow, and it's not, in my mind, views. It's not any of this. The bad impact is the killing of the community spaces. And it's very easy to uh, move from density into anonymity, like nobody knows anybody, it's just basically a city of people running in circles. And working in New York so hardly to try to fix it, I think it's very important to me to send that message here that this is something that uh, I think is, is very important to consider. Clearly you guys do it anyways. This is what you mean with the Layer City uh, case as well? Is, is it the exploration of these kinds of new challenges? Well, it's a di you, could, you can call layering or differentiation. Layering, um, I also refer to scale eh, and, and to, say, the, the layers of time. And Rotterdam, of course, um, because it, was, uh, it had an empty center uh, in 1940 and it had to be rebuilt, um, for a period it had very few layers uh, in this uh, in this heart of the city, so it sort of has to catch up with that. It has to um, go through decennia to sort of get back to this level where you you get this complexity and it it becomes more lively and layered. And that's not only in terms of say uh, buildings and size of buildings and skill, but also in terms of program. Rotterdam is still working very hard to. Um, to get more people to live in the city center. I remember these, this diagram that was published somewhere 15 years ago, the two bars, Amsterdam that had 60,000 people working in the city center and 60,000 people living in the city center. And Rotterdam had the same amount of people working in the city center, but only 30,000 people living there. And, um, one of the missions, of course, of Rotterdam became to get more people to live in the in the Binnenstad, in the center. And, um, well, as it turns out, the, the strategy that is most uh, obvious for that is to build towers. Because, yeah, there is already so much here. So there is not like you cannot do this sort of area development that you can do in the harbor area where uh, the city owns the land and uh, you do a top-down master plan and you organize it with quality committees and everything, Rick Bakker on top of it, and you, <laughs> you get a great uh, area. In, this, in the city, people buy land and they buy buildings and they come to the municipality with, can I do to 200 meters here? Or can I do this here? Or can I do that there? And then they bring long foam bars and then Arjen Knoester comes with his saw and he chops them <laughs> off. And that's where the conversation starts. So that's a bit different way of uh, making the city, of course. 
So and now we have three weeks, right? So every, these, these foam models are over here. Normally they're up in the, in the Rotterdam Tower. So we made a point of it to bring them out and to have them here. It's what we want to test, right? If, if, this is a, if we have a space like this in Rotterdam and everybody's welcome, what then would, what could we find out, right? In, in, in sharing this, what you have shared with all of us. So I'm curious what you would, in three weeks, what should we find out? What should we learn? What should we look for? You want me to give my closing statement already? Or uh, <laughs> <laughs> I can so you write it down. And then Maybe you have to ask <laughs> I'm working towards that case. I'm seeing people on the crutches. It's, it's 20 minutes. Here, I know. But <laughs> so keep that. Keep that. Um, Iran, and for, for, for your project here, the proposition is clear. You want to open up the building again. So we, we, are, we are testing it. So in three weeks, what should we find out? If it's up to you, what should we share? Which story should do we want to email you? What should be in it? <laughs> what, what, where's your curiosity? Because the building is already uh, close to being start built. So where's still the curiosity if you want to have what you presented here? Well, you know, as I said, I, I spent a good part of my time in the past two years in, in Rotterdam. I made great friends. I met a lot of good people. I fell in love with this place. Um, because I think there's not many cities around the world that has this level of opportunity that this city has at this junction of time. And the reason is, um, is because Rotterdam becoming more and more a center, a cultural center again, not only I think in, in the Netherlands, but also in the perspective of the entire world, and it's a city that has been dynamic already. It's used to being a dynamic city from the war. It's a city that trained itself for, what, 80 years now? To make brave decisions, to bring great architecture, to try new things for 80 years. And I don't know many cities that have done that in that period of time. So I think that there's a full generation of people here that have trained their brains and you know, their lifestyle to the fact that change is good. And the debate about what is the next step is a usual conversation. Uh, Rotterdam now is in the gate of uh, defining its future. And the future is coming very quickly. I mean, the towers, the density of this is, is coming so quickly. In about 20 years, we're going to live in a, you guys are going to live. Hopefully, I would have an apartment here. Uh, in a, a totally different city. So I think the critical question now is, one, what is it that we want our city to look like? What are the critical aspects that we can't give up on? If it's affordability, is it mixed use, is it the livelihood of the streets? What, what are these very important topics? And how we, as a community of changers, as a community of creators, a community of people that done it for 80 years, how are we going to uh, sort of face the next step? I, I, I find it fascinating. I think the involvement of so many people and the care that people have for their city is exceptional. I haven't seen it in other places, more places. The, the crowd is not that intrigued. So I think that you should take that opportunity collectively as people and really kind of scrutinize and look at yourself in a mirror and say, what, what is it that we want to become? We'll be doing that. I know, so thanks. Uh, well, just uh, because all these people are still in the crutches, I'm going to keep it uh, with this closing statement by you around and invite Case to share his uh, instead of answering the question. So uh, thank you both for opening the Architecture Month with this conversation. And Case, perhaps you can push it a bit further and uh, share with us your view that we have asked you to note down. So thank you, Aran. Thank you. Uh, Applause, people. This morning I phoned uh, Nana de Roo. He is the leader and founder of uh, Powerhouse uh, Company uh, that made this render. 
and it appeared on social media a couple of weeks ago. And when uh, Bas asked me uh, to pick a picture for my uh, closing statement, I've been thinking about that and finally this morning I thought, oh shit, yeah, I have to, I have to bring this render because it sort of captures a bit what I want to ar arrive at at the end of this uh, uh, closing uh, statement. So, like I uh, said uh, before, Rotterdam has become or is becoming a layered city. Um, well, as a, a part of that sort of uh, change of the city, I have witnessed uh, with my own uh, eyes and I've lived here uh, during these uh, changes and I've been part of the debates and discussions on it. But uh, a part was, also, of course, already uh, happening before. But for me, it's really a city where this sort of change is so clearly visible, m more than maybe in any other city uh, that we can imagine. Probably it is because the, what, what makes Rotterdam different from, say, most European cities at least, but certainly also... Um, maybe American cities, is that uh, where most European cities expand from the middle outward, Rotterdam is expanding inward because it had a very empty city center. Of course, um, it, there, were, there were buildings in the city center, but it was very, uh, or rebuilt in a very low density. And say all our newest buildings and our newest projects are built right in the middle of the city and not in the harbor or at the southeast or southwest or on the outskirts or around the periphery. Rotterdam has made scale leaps. More or less every 10 years another building gets dwarfed here. So it's not like, yes, we are all proud, also proud of the buildings that become big, but the first building that I saw that really had this dwarfing effect was the Maastor flat, this beautiful uh, building next to the Erasmusbrug, that with the arrival of the Erasmusbrug and the Nieuwe Heren, the Hoge Heren, um, became all of a sudden, from a very proud and tall uh, building, it became really very tiny. Funny enough, it kept its pride, you know, it's still, it has this architectural quality and it's still a very beautiful uh, building, but completely doesn't look like a high building anymore. But of course, in the 50s, it was one of the highest in Rotterdam. The same happened to a building on the other side of the bridge, the Renzo Piano, that was leaning on the leg and seemed to be quite a quite an important building when it was just erected. You had the, uh, the Renzo Piano KPM building with all these green lights on it. And uh, at the other end of the Wilhelmina Pier there was, of course, Hotel New York. And in between, it was still all the existing uh, stuff. But of course, with the uh, construction of the Rotterdam, uh, also Renzo Piano became a dwarf also a very nice one, you could say, and now they revitalized the, the lights on it. It's uh, new and also the building has had uh, an update so it can get along again. And this sort of uh, change is going on all the time in Rotterdam and it makes it very uh, interesting to be a witness of it. We moved from our uh, office building on the Boompjes to uh, on Boompjes 55 to Boompjes 255 in the former Nederlandse bank this brick building with a nice uh, green roof on top of it. <coughs> and uh, what is funny is that I still remember meetings in uh, Welstand where there was a project for a tower hoovering over this uh, building. So the Ernst & Young Tower, there were two towers, there was the Ernst & Young right next to it and there was supposed to be another one to come uh, hoovering over. That one was killed, luckily enough. And uh, the Nederlandse Bank has been restored and it's now office space and it will be one of the few brick buildings left on that, in that area 
standing on the riverfront when all the other towers are built. And we have our office there now. It's very nice to be in such an important building, which is low and which is very important simply because of its sort of uh, nerksheid and robustheid that it has. So this change is, uh, is something very interesting in Rotterdam. Rotterdam can handle a lot. It can handle a markthal, it can handle uh, the Rotterdam, it can handle the Erasmusbrug, it can handle a couple of towers. I have learned that it can really absorb quite some uh, ideas and projects, and it only makes the city better and richer. Um, whereas, now I do the comparison with Amsterdam, it's inevitable. It's where I also started my uh, office, so I have to say something about it, but I always explain the canals in Amsterdam as the first area development in the Netherlands. I'm not sure if that is entirely historically true, but basically the canals, of course, was a very uh, good uh, commercial venture for the city. And it was really s developed and, and done in a very uh, smart way, you could say. And Amsterdam has built this uh, tradition of keep on doing that with the islands on the east side of the city, going from Borneo and Sporenburg all the way to uh, Haven, Eiland uh, and Eiburg. So Amsterdam is sort of also on the south side, Amsterdam Zuid, Plan Berlage, later uh, west and uh, Buitenveld. Amsterdam has this tradition for, say, the long stroke, master plans and uh, expansions. While Rotterdam, because it was bombed, um, and rebuilt very quickly based on a 3D vision of Witteveen that was executed in 2D by Van Tra. 3D was too difficult in Rotterdam, so they kicked out Witteveen and uh, the pragmatic people of Rotterdam chose somebody that accepted to do it in 2D. And um, that's the reason why now we have all these all this space to do these fantastic projects in the city center because it's built in such a sort of thin and empty way that there are space enough to make uh, densification. So, but this requires sort of not a master plan or a vision because that's not possible, it requires strategic interventions. So each project is, a, is contributing to, to it, but it cannot be contained in one vision. And um, this means that the 3D of Rotterdam is an architectural 3D. It's in 3D of objects, objects that are plugged in this way to empty city center. And that is what makes Rotterdam so special. And that's something you have practically nowhere, I would say, in any European city. But this requires negotiation, and that's why all the projects in Rotterdam are negotiated. This requires supervisors. I'm not the only one that is doing this kind of thing. And it requires trial and error. A lot of trial and a lot of error. And at a certain moment we, we thought and we learned, maybe this was like 10 or 15 years ago, that we also had to take in account wind climate, and we had to think a little bit about the sun, and we had to think about the quality of the public space, and we launched the City Lounge program, and Rotterdam in a city started paying attention to all these things. So as we go along with all these projects and interventions, we also get better at it, getting slowly better at densifying this uh, city. So Rotterdam grows in its heart, and uh, it grows in its empty uh, center. And the weakness it has, has become its strength. The fact that we had this empty center and it was a bit boring and not so nice has become actually the, the best quality that Rotterdam has. So it's not the harbor, it's also very uh, good uh, quality of course, but it's actually the, the potential it has to innovate in its center. So, what is then the innovation? Of course, Amsterdam has of in innovated a lot in the last decennia with low-rise, high-density projects. 
So it invented new types of low-rise dwellings, houses without a garden where people with the buck feet uh, want to live. Um, in Rotterdam we still have to find a way how to do that. You know, people with the buck feet, they still live in Rotterdam West. So how do we get them to uh, the city center? How do we get them to go into this tower and create this kind of uh, uh, ambiance? <laughs> I live in an apartment building already uh, all the period that I was in Rotterdam. I know I can speak from my own experience that it is possible to do that with children. You don't have to live in Rotterdam West. It is possible to live in an apartment building in the city center of Rotterdam. But it requires to challenge the mindset, but it also maybe requires us to think, after now we have know how to make high buildings, and we know how to get the public space in order, now we have to start thinking how we can live in these high buildings, and not live only with uh, couples that are retired or divorced, but also with our families, before we divorce. <laughs> so, my message for the Architecture Month is to get the different agendas of designers and the city and the developers and the investors uh, um, together and ask this question how we can make the inhabitation of all these buildings that are going to densify the city, whether or not it's towers or other big buildings, how to inhabit them in such a way. And Aaron has shown us some examples and he has shown us his inspiration, how it's done in New York. It is about community, it is about sharing spaces. It's not only about making efficient towers with small apartments in it, but it's also about um, collective amenities, it's about finding maybe new types, new buildings, uh, building types to, to do this. And I want to give one small hint. Arjen said that it was not such a bad idea when I tested it on him. I always like to make little uh, calculations, little sums, summages. And, um, well, of course, it's obvious that when you build towers, you have less public space needed to serve them, you know. An average street all takes about 40 square meter per unit, per house, in public space, just for, for the cars and, the, and to reach it. When you are in a building, part of this, what is normally outside on the street, the, the public space, goes into the building because the elevators and the corridors are the route to your uh, private uh, apartment. But the city, the, the municipality doesn't have to maintain it and they don't have to pay for it, you know. So why doesn't the city then, if, they, if it's so beneficial for them to densify, because they don't have all that maintenance of all the streets in Kralingen and in Rotterdam West and the trees and the parks that have to be taken care of because we're all living in towers, there is no public space anymore. So why not ask the city then to also invest a little bit in these towers and help us to make this, uh, these amenities. That is something I want to to put on the agenda, or at least I want to mention and see if it can be, can be done. Maybe the maintenance or the saving on maintenance of public space, maybe the net present value can be calculated. We're doing a lot of DBFMO projects at the moment. And I learned that if you calculate the net present value of the window cleaning or the, if you you can even use natural stone in a building. It's cheaper if you calculate all the maintenance than plaster that I learned from a contractor. So if you apply this to the city, maybe we can arrive at different uh, business models and it maybe opens up the possibility not only to make towers for pensionados and divorced people, 
but make towers for everybody. Great statement. Thank you. <laughs>